Good afternoon. I have uh, personally looked forward very much to this session and um, I welcome you all to the discussion around the, the uh, future digital economy. Um, I um, would like to start 25 years ago in 1989 where two very significant events changed the world dramatically. First of all, we saw the Berlin Wall come down, and with that, an era of uh, no more Cold War and an opportunity for business to globalize everywhere. And that same year, the World Wide Web was born out of an um, experiment in CERN, a need to manage documents, and with that, of course, a significant opportunity for change and transformation. Now, 25 years later, we have for the first time again seen some geopolitical challenges where some of the assumptions of unlimited globalization has been significantly challenged. Yet, on the technology side, we are seeing an increased pace of innovation and new opportunities. We have, in fact, over the last only five years or so, seen a radical disruption of certain industries, starting in the music industry, any product that could be 100% digitized was digitized and the consequences were quite significant for those companies that were in those industries. In many ways, um, you could argue also for the better, more efficiency, efficiency in reaching customers and in efficiency in supply chains. Now, we believe that we've only seen the beginning of this transformation. And it is in sharp contrast to the geopolitical challenges that we're seeing. So today we'll talk about what is needed in ensuring a thriving, open, and secure digital economy, a global digital economy. And I am, for a change here on the panel, asking the question, because this is a rather easy question to ask, but not so easy to answer. We have a distinct panel, and I'm proud to introduce our four panelists very briefly. They namely don't need long introductions. Uh, Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of uh, Facebook, um, member of the board, but also member of the board of a number of companies and institutions, including Walt Disney. Welcome. Eric Smith, joined uh, Google 2001, um, executive chairman of Google. Um, and also, I must say, the uh, co-chair of Davos this year and a long supporter of the World Economic Forum. Thank you for that, Eric. We have um, Satya Nadella. Uh, he is the CEO of Microsoft. Joined Microsoft many years ago, 1992. Um, he had took over the leadership role uh, approximately a year ago. Um, lots of change at Microsoft since then. And I must say, a significant launch yesterday right. of Windows 10. So we are very pleased that you made it here. Thank you. And Vittorio Colau, CEO, Vodafone, um, joined Vodafone 2008. And Vodafone being one of the few true global players in the infrastructure needed to support this digital economy. We had a session earlier with Merkel where someone talked about the plumbing. I think we agreed on the highway for the digital economy. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to open this discussion with a brief introduction by each of the panelists on the vision for the future. What is your vision for the future state of the digital economy? And are you, generally spoken, optimistic or pessimistic about that future and why? And Vittorio, would you start that? Uh, let, let me take it uh, in reverse order. I am absolutely optimistic uh, because uh, I see a movie in front of me and I know the end of the movie and I see in the 30 to 50 countries where we operate in a little bit where the story is today and I can tell you the story is absolutely at the beginning. It's just uh, the beginning of a great story. And if you think that the movie is a movie of uh, everybody 
connected with very low latency, very high speed, ultra dense connectivity available for objects and human. And you see where we are today. You say, you're really at the beginning of something amazing. What we are seeing is uh, a complete change in the way people farm in Turkey, where we have the largest uh, uh, farmer club uh, improving productivity, where the way people manage their health, the way people uh, are educated. 240,000 people in Egypt are educated through our technology, 60% of them women, by the way, which was not possible and probably not affordable until the beginning of the movie. Uh, education of teachers, South Africa. Uh, Inclusion. Mobile, we talk a lot about mobile money uh, in emerging markets. One third of Kenya's GDP goes through payments. Finally, women have a secure, and the youth have a secure place where to store the money, and they can save time and increase productivity. And then you go into mature markets and you know energy savings and smart buildings and uh, whatever. The beautiful thing that Google are working on. And I see the freeing up, not just of productivity and money, but also positive energy, which can really bring a more equal world. And so, if you move uh, the movie to the last scene, which is going to be, I don't know, 10 or 15 years from now, you can only be very optimistic. Now, it's going to be hard to get there, and we'll discuss how we get there. Thank you very much. Sacha? You know, I'm optimistic. There's no question. I mean, I think everyone in this panel as people who are in the technology business, you have to be optimistic um, about what technology does. But the thing that I'm most grounded on is the role of technology. Ultimately, to me, it is about the human capital and the human potential. And technology empowers humans to do great things. Uh, and so you have to be optimistic about uh, what technology can do in the hands of humans and how they exercise that. Now, I think the key issue, though, is there needs to be a new global consensus, uh, which I think is what we will probably talk a lot about in this panel, that allows technology to progress and yet find that balance with what I would call legitimate interests that individuals have, societies and cultures have, and governments have. Uh, so I think that in order for us to truly see the benefits of technology, we need to get to that global consensus. And to your movie metaphor, that's where things can go wrong. And in order for us to have a happy ending, that's the discussion that we all need to have. Thank you. Eric, are you as optimistic? Um, I think I'm the most optimistic of anyone you're going to find. And I, we've spent the last couple of decades here talking about the transition to all the world's knowledge, right? We now have basically available to us through many apps in many different ways, companies represented here in this room, et cetera, um, this enormous amount of information now. And new developments in the machine intelligence will make us far, far smarter as a result. And this means everyone on the planet. The genetics revolution has a huge and positive impact on the way we'll treat disease, progression of disease, and so forth and so on. And it's all basically because these smartphones are really supercomputers, and everybody here has one. An interesting statistic is that on the order of 400 million people in the past year got a smartphone. And if you think that's a big deal, imagine the impact on that, some, on that person in a developing world. And as a result, the globalization that this forum and that all of us believe in has produced ties that bind. It is no longer possible for a country to sort of step out of some basic assumptions in banking and in communications and in morals and in the way people communicate. You cannot isolate yourself anymore. You just doesn't work. So if I go forward, I imagine a whole new generation of technology and ideas. Um, think about a computer that gives you enormously personal, helpful advice. What should I do today? What am I interested? Where should I go? How do I make these choices? Think about energy. We're all concerned about climate change and all those sorts of things. Much more efficient energy usage, a huge issue for the planet. Um, greater personal security for all sorts of ways and reasons. And think about learning and education with all the new tools that are being built. We're on the cusp of an acceleration of the level of impact of that, and it's almost overwhelmingly good. Thank you very much. 
Any pessimism, though? <laughs> no, not for me. Um, I want to answer the question with three stories. Two brothers in Tamil Gang, India, lived in a village where you couldn't get to a hospital because there was no road, so people died. And so a couple of years ago, they built a Facebook page, they raised $100,000, and they built the People's Road to China with volunteers they recruited. Last year, I was in Korea. I met a woman named Kai Young. She had saved up to go to law school, but then she took her law school tuition, dropped out of law school, and built an app which would enable you to find same-day hotel rates. And she now employed eight people and was starting to move out to other countries in Asia. And then just last month at Facebook, I met a woman who's become one of my heroes named Masi. And she started a Facebook page, page which now has 750,000 followers called My Stealthy Freedoms. And this page has pictures of women. They take themselves in Iran, out in the open without headscarves, which is a punishable crime. And there's a photo on this page of a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter. And the grandmother says, I wanted my granddaughter to feel the wind on her hair before it was gray. That's why I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because these three stories happen in a world where only 40% of people have internet access. And if we can extend to more people, we increase voice. And importantly, it's not just them learning from us, it's us learning from them. It's us understanding Masi and the world she comes from. We increase economic opportunity, and we're going to talk about job creation. Technology is both a destroyer and a creator of jobs, but it really brings economic opportunity, like you see with the young woman in Korea. And we increase equality. Women are still much less likely to have internet access. Women are much less likely to get phones. Women are much less likely to get educated. And that's holding all of us back because we know that women invest in their children when they have access. And so I'm a huge optimist because if we can do all this with 40%, imagine what we can do when we get to 50, 60, 70, and hopefully everyone. Oh, so there we are in a um, more concerned Davos than last year. Here's a panel of optimistic, opportunity. It sounds like optimism for human beings, for society, for everyone. Um, I think that's a good start. I'm also hearing some pretty significant change. So let's talk about the change first. And, and um, maybe coming back to you, Shell, Facebook has changed the way we interact with each other, no doubt. Um, the term friend has a no meaning. Um, where do you see that going? Are we going to um, accelerate that pace? Are we becoming more old-fashioned. Where do you see the interaction between people going in terms of change? I remember the old internet joke where you had the dog in front of the computer. And it said, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. And that was because the internet was anonymity. No one would put their real name or face on the internet. And that really changed. It changed with social networking. It changed with Facebook. And I think that's really important because this is the historical shift from the historically powerful to the historically powerless because everyone has voice. If you think back to before the technologies that everyone up here deploys and develops, if you wanted to reach the world and you were not someone who had access, what would you do? Pass out flyers? Now everyone can post, everyone can share, and that gives voice to people who historically have not had it, and I think represents something truly profound in the world. So you're saying it will reduce the divide, not increase the divide? I think it does. I mean, certainly there are a lot of divides which are increasing, but if you look at the power of technology and particularly social technology, it gives people voice, more equal voice than we've had before, and we've seen those impacts on the world. Thank you. Satya, you rep represent not just the consumer side of things, but also business uh, technology. I've been in the IT industry myself for 25 years, seen some pretty significant changes to the way you run business. Talk about that transformation. Yeah, I mean, our core identity um, is all about providing the platforms and tools for others, both individuals and organizations, to take advantage of technology and transform themselves. So we have over a billion customers who use our productivity services, and we have over you know, 100 plus million businesses we deal with. And when you see what they're doing, it's very diverse. Uh, just this week, in fact, there was this fantastic story. In fact, Eric was talking about machine intelligence. Um, and the story I came across was someone who was a pig farmer in China is using machine learning to get much better at being able to produce 
things that can actually get to market and make them a profit. Uh, now, who would have thought? And they're doing it with a simple app that's on running on their phone, but they're using intelligence that's running on the cloud. You go to even come to Switzerland, there is a company in Switzerland uh, that builds a banking solution, Terminos, which is a very successful uh, company out of Switzerland. But the most fascinating thing is that they've been able to take that software, run it in the cloud, and get banks in Africa to be able to run these banks with literally no IT staff. Uh, so that means if you think about financial inclusion in Africa, which requires credit lending institutions and banks, uh, the ability for something like that to start up is sort of come down in a pretty big way. You even take a set of volunteers, uh, parents, their access to technology has increased to a point where type one diabetes children and their parents came together and built a cloud solution to be able to monitor children with type 1 diabetes wherever they are, instead of hovering around them when they're at games, so that they can get alerts when things need to be attended to. So that's the kind of diverse digital transformation that we are seeing, because one, the costs and the barriers have come down, and the ability for groups, small businesses in particular, one of the things that we did was a recent survey, which shows that small businesses and their access to technology has never been better. And because of that, they are being more productive and therefore they're being able to employ more and have high aspirations because of the markets being connected. And so that's the widespread and very diverse transformation I see. So it looks like a, a significant opportunity for individuals, for businesses in all industries. I'm seeing that. E Eric, um, Google has hired what, you've doubled the amount of employees at Google the last, since 2010, 50,000 approximately now. Are we as an industry creating jobs or are we killing jobs faster than we are creating them? Well, the, the question you're asking can be understood as sort of how does the labor market change as a result of all of this technology? Correct. And Let's posit that the highly educated, the people who are driving this will all be fine. In other words, everybody in Davos and the Davos universe will be fine. What we're talking about is, is all of the people who are dispossessed by technological change. Now, this is not a new story. It's been true for hundreds of years. And there's no question there is dislocation. The core question is an economic one. Can you afford to stay behind in a technological or business opportunity or does it more make sense to become more efficient? All the laws of economics tell you that a globalized solution that is more efficient ultimately produces better wealth for everyone. And you solve the problem of inequality, which is a significant one, through progressive tax policies and so forth. Again, this is not news. So often the question is then asked, well, what happens to the person whose job is lost? Well, it's the same thing that happened when people stopped farming and started using tractors and so forth. They find new skills and new services. And, and so there's this enormous meme in the society where everyone assumes that this time it's different. That somehow the work that all of us are doing and all the people in the room are doing, is somehow no one's gonna have a job in the world and it's you know, just gonna be the Davos elite and we're just gonna have a good time and everyone else is gonna be rioting or some stereotype like that. It's completely false, right? The correct answer is that everyone gets smarter because of this technology because it's free or very inexpensive. And the empowerment of people is the secret to technological progress. Over and over again, it's been a transition from the elites. Remember, the elites were the only people who could read right, now then everyone could read. The elites were the only ones who were educated, now everyone can, can, can be educated. The elites were the only ones who had entertainment, now everyone has education. So we are all participating in this enormous transition where billions of people are joining our party, right, joining our fun and joining our anxiety, right? They're all getting the same knowledge and activities and education. And if you get depressed, talk to the people that Cheryl talked about or the people that I meet with, for whom the arrival of the smartphone is the most important thing in their life, perhaps besides that of a child. That's literally how dramatic a life change is for them. So you're saying that, you know, we've seen this kind of change before, it's just a repeat. I would challenge that in one sense, that 
when we went from agriculture to industrial age, it took you know, one or two generations to get there. And hence, we had enough time to kind of adjust. And with my experience in technology, the speed of which technology is driving change is at a very, very significant pace. So can we keep up with well, that pace, or is that well, a risk for this transformation? Well, first place, there is a, there's no question. You're, you're, the basis of your question is correct, that things are happening more quickly. But we're also a, wealthy glo a wealthier globe. There are more people involved and so forth. But let's use the self-driving car. Right? The original ideas were developed in the 1990s. The first self-driving car won the challenge in 2004, 10 years ago. Right? They're just now, technologies inspired from that 20 years ago are beginning to become in cars, and most of you are not in those today. Right? It takes much longer for these technolog technological things to occur than people think about. So there is hope. Um, uh, I, um, I have one concern, though, when you look at the world today, and I'm coming back to my introduction that you know, this assumption that the world is under kind of one system, there's no, no real tension anymore, and, and we can globalize as much as possible. Technology is, by definition, global. And yet, I am seeing, I think everyone is seeing, a, an increased tendency to regionalization, even fragmentation, special rules. Um, talk a little bit about that, Vittorio. How does that look from an infrastructure point of view? You're one of the most global providers of, of infrastructure. You have a huge presence in, in India, uh, which is a very different market to the European markets you're in, Africa. And, and Africa as well. How is that evolving? And can we avoid this fragmentation? What do we need to do to avoid that? We must avoid fragmentation. Uh, the point, uh, I mean, fragmentation would actually, if you go back to my movie thing, it means that you start slowing down frame by frame the movie. And you don't want to slow down because, as Eric said, this is the greatest opportunity that we have to really improve living conditions everywhere and, you know, whatever, resource management everywhere. So we cannot allow fragmentation. Is fragmentation happening? Quite frankly, there is a temptation. And I think, if I'm honest, I think that we, including the people in this room today, we have very conflicting kind of feelings. When we talk about privacy, we think about something. But then when something like you know, Paris happens, we, see, we think something else. The whole issue of how we will manage the richness of data, but also the potential dangers of data, is clearly creating very, very conflicting uh, feelings in the population and therefore in policymakers, we should absolutely avoid the fragmentation of uh, this fantastic connectivity we are creating. And I think you, Satya, mentioned it before. That's where we need uh, to try to find the right balance, uh, as you correctly said, between different needs and not try to be too ideological, but be very pragmatic. We need to respect the jurisdictions. I'm not advocating for a second that jurisdictions should not be respected because jurisdictions exist because people vote and there are democracies in the world, not everywhere, unfortunately, but most of the times. But we should try to create harmonization. In Europe, there is a great opportunity because we have something called the European Union that should harmonize. And then between large blocks, again, we should harmonize because otherwise we slow down the movie. And if we slow down the movie, we take away a lot of the benefit from essentially the less fortunate. Also from us, but also essentially from the less fortunate. Talk a little bit about what you've done in, in countries where, let's say, the cost barrier uh, is a different one than what we are seeing in the more, more developed world. How, how are you dealing with that? How are you making Listen, I have a fantastic business? story about India. Uh, in India, there are areas where you look at all of your calculations, your things, and you say, this, this is not economic. And then guess what? We are, we are now finding out that whenever we put you know, a new tower in a place, within eight months, the amount of data, eight months, not eight years or two years, the amount of data that goes through that tower is exactly the same of an area that before we have labeled as a good area. Why is that? You wouldn't believe, because people move from the you know, edges of that area into the area in order to use data. So we need to change a little bit, you know, the way we look at things, change the equation. What is the cost to serve that I have to 
deliver in order to bring something to the country. Now, governments, policymakers have to play ball because if, of course, they try to extract value, the reason why I use with Merkel this digital plumber thing, I prefer to call myself a digital plumber because, yes, there are people who build uh, roads and highways, but sometimes there are people who are against roads and highways. Bring me somebody in the world who is against water pipes. Water pipes are life. We are life. Eric, you had a comment. If I could just, I could just support Vittorio on this, and I say this with almost complete seriousness, almost all of the problems we debate can be solved by literally more broadband connectivity in these countries. And the reason is that broadband is how you address the governance issues, the information issues, the education issues, the personal security issues, the human rights issues, the women's empowerment issues. Simple steps to make broadband occur, it's not a new message, in countries which are lagging are the key government and public policy thing that benefit the majority of the people. I'm quite convinced if you have a government program to get broadband broadly available through partnerships with Vittorio and other kind of countries, the citizens are clever enough, as you, as you showed in India, and I have yet to find a country that doesn't have clever such people in it. They just don't exist. They're all clever enough. Just wire them up and the citizens will take care of a lot. But you've also visited North Korea recently. Yes, and an we do unwired see, uh, country. <laughs> unwired. And we do see some uh, tendencies that, you know, with this um, availability of technology and access and information flow, uh, it, it, things seem uncontrollable and quite scary for some countries, and they put different rules. What does that well, do to uh, this development, the opportunity that we have at hand? The have? internet is the greatest empowerment of citizens with respect to a government in many, many years. Because all of a sudden, the citizens have a voice. They can be heard. And we forget that millions of people live in countries where they have grievances or issues, and we haven't heard them because there's no functioning press, we can't talk to them, we can't hear from them. One of the greatest things about the internet is we're hearing those voices. And by the way, they have serious concerns. So in North Korea, the numbers, they're on the order of now four million internet connections, but they're all through data phones, and the data phones don't roam. So it's not possible to connect from there outside the internet, except through roughly 100 IP addresses. Internet use of the kind that we're used to is heavily supervised. A simple rule is if you're a college student, you have to use the internet with another college student who's watching you. Graduate students, by the way, can use the internet on their own, but you can assume that there's computers watching what they're doing. So it really is very much a surveillance of use, and that's ultimately not good for the country, and it's certainly not good for global safety. But is there a risk that we get the fragmentation? And, and, and what happens? And Satya, you, you've been trying to penetrate some countries. I, I heard a, a, a previous CEO from Microsoft say, we have a high penetration in China. We're just not making any money. Um, how do you see that uh, evolving? And, and what are you doing to make technology, let's say, affordable to, to the billions of people? Yeah, look, if I sort of step back and think about from our perspective as um, the technology industry, what are the three big issues that I think we need to tackle and we have to tackle with the regulators, the governments, um, and, and also amongst ourselves? I would say there are three things. One is a discussion we had around is the spoils of technology being evenly spread? Uh, that's because of an issue that I think we have to tackle head on and we've got to be able to talk and Cheryl talked about the stories <laughs> that really highlight that yes, in fact, technology can impact a lot of people and it's good for society overall. But that narrative has to be broadly understood and believed in. The second uh, aspect is we've got to get this balance between privacy and at the same time use of data for legitimate Public safety. Uh, I don't think any of us can sit here and deny uh, the use of data in order to be able to have governments protect us. And then the last one I would say is this uh, fragmentation issue. The internet is one of the greatest global goods uh, and common good. And if we destroy it, we destroy a lot of our economic future. But yet, how do we get that balance where whatever is the cultural sensitivity, whatever is the local economic interest, uh, how do we 
get to that next level of sophistication where we really avoid the real nightmare scenario of balkanization of the internet, but yet we have to accommodate for these legitimate interests. These are the three topics, I think, a forum like this uh, can in fact facilitate great dialogue between all the constituents, and then we need a global consensus. I don't think any set of us can make those rules, nor can a single government make that rule, uh, because either one of those things will fail. Uh, and that's where I think we have to put our minds and, uh, and energy to. But let's stay with this, uh, this uh, challenge of the missing five billion people who don't have access. We have two billion people online. Uh, clearly, uh, a lot of disruption, a lot of opportunity, a lot of you know, happy faces in, in what you can do. Um, Facebook as an organization, um, from a business model point of view, is really based on the amount of people that come together on your platform. So you must be extremely interested in getting the remaining five uh, billion people online. We are, and I think at its heart, it's worth understanding that this is a cost problem. So World Bank puts global poverty at $1.25 a day. One in six people on the planet lives under that limit. If you're a connected average Facebook user, your implicit cost of data in the United States is $1 a dollar a day. So that means the developed world is spending in data what the developing world lives on. And so the only way we're gonna make more data accessible and unleash all the potential that everyone here talked about is if it gets cheaper. And so everyone on the stage, I think, is working on it in their own way. And there have to be lots of different approaches to connect 60% more of the world. Uh, we have something, a project we call internet.org, which tries to provide free data in different places. We've launched uh, four apps, and in about an hour, we're launching our fifth in Ghana. And what it does is it's an app that anyone can get that provides free Facebook, free Messenger, free Wikipedia, free access to UNICEF's Facts for Life, to other health and uh, mother, motherhood-based information, uh, civil rights for women, pregnancy information, advice on, on, healthy, on healthy children. And what we've seen from our launches in other countries is that people have healthier babies because they can get basic information on what they should do during pregnancy or during early childcare. And women understand what their rights are or people can look up information on Wikipedia. Um, this isn't the whole answer, but it is a way of getting some people some data for free. And we think that's really important and there have to be a whole number of other things. But fundamentally, the economics have to change to get the rest of the people online. Because as things are currently priced, they can't afford it. So, so who's paying for this? Vittoria, are you going to provide the infrastructure for that for free? Or? Yeah, actually, I would like Cheryl to say whether she's paying for the bandwidth or not. Because, the, of course, the concept is good. The issue is uh, who pays for the investment and for the spectrum and for the infrastructure that is required for that. Now, if Facebook, in its own generosity, wants to donate part of your very large market cap into this, this is great. Uh, but that's your choice. Uh, I am more a fan of finding structural ways, not just commercial ways or, or promotional ways, which are very noble, I'm not saying they're not bad, but you know, they're not the real, to reduce the cost uh, of providing data into those situations. And therefore, uh, again, examples like the one I made, we, we really need to work uh, on different models, different, we work a lot with the infrastructure manufacturers to reduce the cost of energy, we reduce, to reduce the cost uh, of backup, solar is becoming an important uh, source uh, in many countries, to find ways also, quite frankly, to share this investment, in, especially in rural or very poor areas, like we do in India, for example, in order to make it sustainable in the long term. Free, to me, doesn't sound like sustainable in the long term. The Eric, you have a rather big investment in, in, in balloons well, and infrastructure. Yes. Talk what, about that. What's interesting is that when you study the, the poorest countries, the most profitable part of the industries in those companies, often up to 10% of the GDP, are in fact the telecommunications companies who are operating at very, very low price points. So we do have proof that in the traditional telephony, not the smartphones, there are entrepreneurs and companies and so forth that have been able to figure out Vittorio's model. So I'm hopeful that we can do the same thing. For Google's contribution, we're working on a different technology to see if that works, and it's balloons which float around in the stratosphere. 
And they literally are float about 100 miles, roughly 100 miles an hour, sort of you know, in the direction of the wind at that level. Um, and working with the local telecommunications provider, they'll actually provide an LTE signal to a very remote person. So a simple rule of how you get broadband everywhere, which is sort of my, my underlying religion, is you, your first choice would always be a fiber optic connection, ideally directly to your home. Um, and in the advanced economies, people have that. Um, your second choice would be using various forms of wireless because the government bu is busy selling that off to you, and they shouldn't do that. They should just give it to the telecom operators because it's such a public good. Um, and then the third would be using technologies for very rural areas to reach them, satellite, balloons, and others. We, the combination of the sum of them prevent, provides a communications web of enormous value to the world. Yeah, I mean, I think just adding on to Eric's piece, I think the, the thing that's fantastic is even amongst the panelists here, there's absolute consensus that low-cost bandwidth is a must for economic development to reach everyone. In fact, if you want to solve inequity issues and give opportunities to everyone, let's start by getting that infrastructure. And all of these various technologies, I mean, you talked about the balloons, one of the technologies that you know, we have been pioneering. Uh, and, and by the way, there's no one solution here. We would want all of these, in fact, to play in, in that roadmap you described. And the technology that we are very interested in is white space. How do we use the TV white space uh, more effectively, and in fact, we've done a bunch of radio work to reduce the interference so that you can, in fact, in Ghana, um, use TV white space. We are partnering with a local ISP to provide a now a rural internet service. Um, and the sustainability comes because now this local ISP has a low-cost service that they are doing. And to your point about having a model which is sustainable, that's the way we are going to create markets uh, for people to get access. Uh, and so that's, I think, key to how we have to have innovation, and then innovation needs to be brought to market, uh, and the regulators have to play a role, the local entrepreneurs have to play a role, and then at the end result is people with smartphones have great access to services. And, and you should say, by the way, that the white space is the space between the channels that you never yeah. see. <laughs> that's right. Vittorio. Yeah, I would like to say, you know, a, a thing which will bring a bit of credit to uh, about my joke about the generosity of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Facebook. We really have to be grateful to, for companies like the ones that are here because I have to tell you, balloons. If I'm honest, when I got the phone call from Google saying tomorrow morning we are announcing that we do the balloons and that, uh, my answer was, my reply was Nikesh, who was then working for Google, what did you smoke? I mean, <laughs> balloons? So here you're talking, you know, you're, you're talking about the largest European or one of the largest in the world telecommunication company. I, I really thought it was crazy. Believe it or not, we are now working with them and we think they actually might work. So back to this balance and this good cooperation between governments, and I think technology companies like these three are doing a lot of great things for the world. We need to incorporate their ability to deploy and then my poor, humble plumbing, together with governments to let them understand what the opportunity is in front of us, what nice hand this movie can have. And this is the big challenge because, of course, you're talking about very complicated, and you know, your white space thing is just one example. Sure. But it goes, it's great. And it goes to where you started on the panel, which is, are you a pessimist or an optimist? If you are an optimist in the technology industry or long optimist, you believe that connectivity will give people voice, that this will work out, that we're going to try a lot of things and fail. The technology industry is also one that's willing to try different approaches that don't work, but that fundamentally we will succeed and people's lives will be better. And I think we believe that, and that doesn't mean there aren't challenges, but there are also, also opportunities. And I think the opportunity we all have, working together in different ways and competing in other ways, is to find ways for technology to make everyone's life better, not just the people who are well-educated and can code. And I think that's a really important point. When we think about that's happening in the global economy, everyone's worried about jobs, and they should be, right? So much technological change, your point that it's happening way faster, the transitions Eric spoke about are happening faster than ever before, all of that is true. But at the same time, technology creates jobs, not just in the technological space, but in the non-tech world. So, you know, when I was in India, these two women are um, fashion students at the Bangalore Fashion Design. They started a company that makes hair accessories 
They make hair accessories and sell them through Facebook. They employ three other women who were previously unemployed. None of them are coding. None of them have the education to code. The women they employ don't have education at all, really. But they've created these hair accessory manufacturing jobs in Bangalore, India, because they can take advantage of technology. And I think all of us are big believers in entrepreneurialism. So think about what it used to take to start a business. You had to get a storefront, get a loan, right? Have an office or build a website, which is expensive. And now, because of technology supplied by everyone on this stage, as well as so many people here in this room and at, and at WEF, you can do that with very low cost. Distribution, marketing, an ability to sell your products and services, those costs, those costs are decreasing. And that makes the ability to start companies and create jobs available to everyone. Yes. Um, just to support the numbers, that all of our companies have lots of numbers, which we can talk about about the scale of this. There are many of estimates that each tech job generates five to seven non-tech jobs that come with it. You remember all those numbers. We have all sorts of GDP growth that correlate these with higher GDP growth in countries. Uh, there are estimates that if there were a single digital market in Europe, which is very high priority for all of us, it would create up to four million new and important jobs in Europe. Well, let's exploit this because there's no doubt that through the opportunity you all talk about um, and the acceleration that's happening, uh, we've seen a tremendous value being created. Um, I compare market cap of top 10 companies uh, 10 years ago and now, a lot of that value went to IT companies. Um, are we at a stage where if you're not an IT company, there is no future? And the second part of that question is, is this a, you know, a winner takes it all kind of game because the nature of what you need to do on, in terms of technology and platform means that it can only be one, otherwise it won't work. Um, how do you see that? Maybe, Vittorio, you start on that. Well, uh, you're really raising an, a, a question on possibility to continue to innovate if dominance is established. Uh, these activities are intrinsically uh, stronger if they have scale, and scale brings monopolies. Can we afford to have monopolies? I would say no, we shouldn't. And I think dominance is another big issue that uh, of the four, I'm the one who probably doesn't have that problem. <laughs> but uh, th we have at some point to face. Uh, now, dominance is not necessarily bad. So you could be a benign dominant player, but of course, back to the point of uh, who will be the judge, who will decide, that's another key point in the movie that at some point will have to be addressed. And again, I say it more in the sense uh, of let's make sure that wrong decisions are avoided, that uh, in order to fix problems, regulators or policymakers can overreact. But I think uh, if we really want to help the entrepreneurs that Cheryl was talking about, or other entrepreneurs, to continue to innovate, to continue to have the dream, one day I will beat Google, one day I will beat Facebook, dominance should be taken out uh, as, a, as a possibility. So yes, there will be also that angle of the story that has to be looked at. Eric, how do you see that? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to have too many search engines, in, in fact, uh, well, and yet uh, th there is a dominance challenge here. How, how do you see that? Well, first place, you, you asked a question about the IT companies versus everybody else. Yes. And I think the evidence is that the winners in every market will be the ones that use software and machine intelligence most effectively to solve customer problems better. And um, I think you're going to see this, you clearly see this in banking, that's been true for a long time. You see it in financial services for a long time. But I think you're going to see it in many, many other industries that have not yet seen the benefits of the software revolution. And the software revolution, which is, by the way, a much larger industry than what you think of as the IT industry, it's all the people in these companies trying to make the delivery of trucks and goods and services and so forth better priced, more efficient, more individual. And we haven't even talked about the scale of healthcare and, and that sort of thing. So if you think of software, uh, the, so the use of software, which all of us try very hard to get into these companies in one way, it is the transformation 
because it makes the company smarter, the executive smarter, the salespeople smarter. It allows you to manage your businesses more efficiently. If you're not using it, you're going to lose to somebody who is, and that's sort of, sort of where we are. And that's going to be true for another decade, for sure, maybe two. On the question of dominance, you now see so many strong tech platforms coming, um, and you're seeing a, a reordering and a future reordering of dominance or leaders or whatever term you want to use because of the rise of the app on the smartphone. And I think all bets are off at this point as to what the smartphone app infrastructure is going to look like. You have a whole new set of players who are taking this new platform, which as I described is essentially, you think of this as a phone, but it's really a supercomputer. And all of us spend a great deal of time thinking about what are the apps that people are going to use, how are they going to solve the problem, are we entering, and I view that as a completely open market at this point. Now, now the benefit of platforms, uh, if you turn it around, is that it, it fosters potentially an enormous ecosystem of, of others who don't have to build the fundamentals but can build on top of. Microsoft has a strategy like that for many years. How would that evolve? Will more innovation happen outside of the company? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big advantage of platforms, they are generative in nature, in the sense that you create a platform so that others can, in fact, build on top of without having to bear the expense that they otherwise would have. Uh, that leverage doesn't come without some scale. And, you know, we, I think, every, you know, Vittorio talked eloquently about what it means to have checks and balances and dominance. Uh, but technology evolution itself, as Eric was saying, can also take care of it uh, in, as paradigm shift, uh, the dominance position shift. But the core thing that needs, is needed in order for broad participation. See, one of the things for me is whenever I visit a country, I make it a point to go visit the partners locally that are betting on our platform. Because to me, that's lifeblood. Uh, because our entire economic model is based on the ability to have lots of local partners who are doing things in healthcare, or in banking, or in energy, or in any sector, on top of our platform. Uh, and that's true for all of us uh, in different forms. And so as a platform provider, you need to make sure that the economics of the platform are not all one-sided, and that there is enough out there to be able to create a generative platform. Otherwise, I think it'll collapse on its own sort of weight. Joe? Sure. I think one thing that underlies all of this, uh, which I know so many people here deeply care about, is also equal access and opportunity. So it's worth remembering that women are much less likely to be educated. Women are much less likely to get phones. They are much less likely to be able to use their phones. And actually, the benefits of getting women connected, often, not always, but often, outweigh the benefits of men getting connected because they will put those investments back into the education and health care of their children. So for example, whenever we provide data, making sure however we do it, because there are a lot of different approaches here, that we actually give information to women on what their rights are or how they get help for a sick child. When you think about what's going to happen, some of the evolutions Eric talked about, all of this is only possible if we really make sure that women get access at the same rate as men. And it's worth understanding that the world is not on that path. 17 countries of hundreds are run by women. 5% of the top jobs in almost any country in the world, regardless of their legal structures around women. And particularly as we look at basic education and access to data, unless we intervene, we means this community of everyone here, Women will not get the same opportunities to participate in these platforms, participate in this growth as men. And so it's something that I think takes an active and a different role than we've had before. I think that is a splendid segue into taking a few questions from the audience, the ecosystem of these uh, leading technology companies. Were they very strong tendency for optimistic views and so solutions to the challenges that we are facing. Please, anyone. There's a question down there. And could I please ask you to um, present yourself and also direct your question uh, to one of the panelists? Stu Eisenstadt. Um, one thing that was not asked or addressed is the misuse of the internet by terrorist groups, criminal gangs, cyber attacks, 
uh, the ability of terrorist groups to organize and finance using the Internet, uh, and then the government's demand, which you've all faced, to sh in a way of combating that, to try to get information from you that may compromise your own customers' privacy. Could you discuss those range of issues? Vittorio? Uh, yeah, you raise a point which is, of course, uh, very true. Uh, bad people use the internet, not just good people. And, uh, of course, society needs to be sure that uh, you can defend. Now, the question is, what is the appropriate way for a government, for any government, to make sure that they protect their own citizens without going beyond what is appropriate and commensurate to the threat. And again, in the telecom sector, we've been used to this since, you know, when I was young. The issue is to have a very clear, and I would want to use the word transparent way of how you do it. For example, we were the first European operator publishing a transparency report in which we declare to our customers exactly what we do in every country, comma, where we are authorized to describe what we do, comma, and where we are not, we said why. So I think transparency is very important. There's no doubt that governments have the duty to protect their own citizens, and there's no doubt that bad people are using the internet, but it should not be a license to do everything, because again, there is a balance that has to be, to be reached between the two different needs. If we have one more question. There was one in the back as well. Red shirt. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Atul Zanapia. I'm a global shaper from Accra. Um, I used to work at Google too, so it's really nice to see you, uh, Eric. Um, I'm also really uh, proud that Cheryl mentioned the internet.org um, program happening in Ghana, and I know about the Kuforidia White Spaces um, project as well. Um, I've used, I'm, I'm, I've used the internet a lot, and I'm, I'm really championing the use of it in Ghana as well. And I just wanted to pose a question to all of you um, around mobile, uh, mobile internet, around especially sub-Saharan Africa. You know, so many people are using um, phones, and, and I think the interesting thing is that um, there are a lot of people using the internet for Facebook and for um, a lot of communication. Um, how can we get to the point, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where we are doing much more than, you know, just messaging, um, but actual e-commerce, you know, running businesses of the internet? Um, what are some of the things that you can share to help us really do that? Thank you. Eric? I think each of us can contribute a little bit to this. The core problem in Africa has been its geographic bandwidth isolation. For a long time, there was only one cable on the left side of Africa. Now there are multiple cables. There have been problems inside of Africa where the central countries, think of them as like Uganda and so forth, only had satellite access, which is particularly slow and particularly expensive. Many, many com companies, including those represented here, have helped fund the necessary connectivity to get to the cities. So a reasonable expectation is that if you're in one of the larger cities in Africa, you will have reasonably good 4G LTE connectivity from the local providers, in, including in many cases Vittorio's operations. And I think that's a good start. Second problem has been language. Much of the content is not in the, the local languages, and there's, we have funded and others have funded projects to put that. That's relatively straightforward once people get con connected. The, the third has, excuse me, has been payment systems. And I think if you look at the success of M-Pesa in, in Kenya, you mentioned some others, there's a whole bunch of e-commerce, and it sure looks like banking is going to be done over the Internet. So the combination of content and banking is probably enough, at least in the cities, to break the logjam. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question down here. Go ahead. Uh, Khaled Letaya from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I'm just going to have a quick question about the evolution of the internet. We know that the internet started with just, uh, then we, have, we talked about the mobile internet and now witnessing the internet of things. Where, where do you see actually the evolution of the internet, especially in the context of 5G as we move forward? I mean, I think 
I can start, and this is a topic that we can talk for a long time, <laughs> but one of the things that I do believe, um, if you take even 5G in particular, it's the adaptive way that we will use bandwidth. I think that's perhaps one of the most um, uh, you know, breakthrough things that'll happen for us. Uh, because as we sort of get very, very comfortable with any given level of bandwidth, we come up with ways to consume more. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things, technologies that I'm very, very excited about um, is what does it mean to redefine even what mobility means? And today's form factor, of course, uh, is the phone. Uh, and that's, a, that's done a fantastic job of democratizing access, and all the stories you heard today were about how it's really enabling all this inclusion. What's the next metaphor or next paradigm that's in fact going to be more pervasive? Internet of Things is what people talk about. You know, there's different type of battery needs, different type of connectivity needs, uh, and that makes computing ubiquitous and intelligence ambient. And so what is the evolution in the bandwidth and also the ch cost of bandwidth that allows us to truly get to ubiquitous computing and ambient intelligence is at least what I see as the future of the internet. I would answer very simply that the internet will disappear. Yeah. The internet will be, there'll be so many IP addresses because of IPv6, so many devices, sensors, things that you're wearing, things that you're interacting with, that you won't even sense it. It'll be part of your presence all the time. Imagine you walk into a room and the room is, is dynamic, right? And you, again, with your permission and all of that, you're interacting with the things going on in the room a highly personalized, highly interactive, and very, very interesting world emerges because of the disappearance of the internet. If I may, I completely agree with uh, Eric. Uh, to me, the biggest question, also in relation to the spectrum utilization, the bigger question, which you know, I will leave it as a Davos question, is will we really, in the future, continue to license spectrum? Do governments license oxygen? <laughs> no. They tax the profit of us, or the income of us, exactly. human beings, who breathe oxygen. Does it make sense? Will it be possible in an ultra-dense uh, uh, connectivity situation to distinguish which spectrum is licensed, which spectrum is not, and who has the right to use what? Again, question that probably I will not see because it's a very long time, but it's oxygen, it's water, it's these type of things. So I think we are, we are coming to an end of this. Um, it's clear that the internet will be like oxygen needed by everyone. Um, in order to come to a final close um, in terms of action, would love to ask just a brief comment from every panelist as a closing remark. What is the problem that your company will work most on and what do you need from someone else in order to accelerate us to that digital global future? In one word? In one word, if you can. Trust. Trust. Re-establishing a positive, constructive trust environment between technology providers, governments, plumbers, and, uh, and customers so that we are really defining in a harmonious way the next uh, frames of the movie. Satya? And I would say global consensus. Um, it cannot be left to any one company or any one government. Uh, there needs to be a global consensus on establishing that trust. Eric? Um, I agree with that. We need governments to do one very important thing, which is to help build and license this infrastructure to make this incredible future happen as quickly as possible. And Cheryl, I would have loved a question from a woman, but I will end with the voice of a woman. Inclusion. Inclusion. Uh, an internet that connects everyone, that's accessible to everyone. 60% of the internet today is in English. If that does not make it clear how uninclusive it is right now, nothing does. We need voices, technologists, entrepreneurs of all types to reflect the diversity that is the world so that the voices can be heard. And I think we can create a more connected and a safer world. I think those are the best words we could end this session. The last 25 years have created significant change. I think today's panel talk about the next 25 years being even more significant, but with an optimistic tone and, I felt, a strong commitment to make sure that that digital world can happen in a trusted, global, and inclusive way. Thank you very much.